gentle sea To this fair breeze All fell the sails Which England's half regale but set Congratulations, Stephen. I lift my cup to your instant posy. A most fitting tribute to our enterprise. And I raise a cup to the brave captains of my little fleet. Master Hayes of the Golden Hind. Master Brown of the Swallow. And Master Andrews of my favorite little vessel, the Squirrel. I toast. Ah, good Master Winter of this sturdy craft, the delight. Things go well on deck. We're through the passage, then. The others are safely in, General, and ourselves almost. To our safe arrival in the new... What? What is it? In heaven's name, what is it, man? Sir Humphrey Gilbert's flagship, the Delight, striking a rock at the narrow entrance to the harbor of St. John's. It was on the afternoon of August the 3rd, 1583, as he sailed majestically through to lay claim to the island of Newfoundland as England's first overseas colony. Good evening, I'm Harry Brown. Welcome to the story of Gilbert, to the Irish, a merciless conqueror, to the English, a soldier resolute in Jesus Christ, to others, one of the Elizabethan era's most dedicated and forgotten imperialists. Despite his inauspicious debut into Canadian history 400 years ago, Gilbert's determination to re-establish an English presence in North America change the destiny of a continent and lay the cornerstone of the greatest empire the world has ever known. I'm here on Signal Hill, the famous tourist attraction that towers above the landlocked harbor at St. John's, Newfoundland. And from here, I can look out to where Sir Humphrey Gilbert's tiny fleet lay 400 years ago. They are off the narrow entrance to North America's oldest city. They waited five days for favorable winds before attempting to navigate the treacherous passage. Three of the smaller ships got through unscathed, but his own vessel, the Delight, struck the chain rock just inside the harbor mouth. Mounted today with a concrete buoy and a flashing light, it's still a threat to the unwary mariner. Striking it was, to say the least, a blow to the great adventurer's pride as well as to his flagship. Just a minute. If you're going to do it, at least get it right. You're him. Yes, I'm him. And I didn't strike the chain rock at all. I struck the other one over there, looky, on the other side. Pancake rock. How in the name of God's great heaven should I know what ye call it in these times? It was over there on the other side, that's all I remember. Historical calumny, that's what it is. No one could be stupid enough to strike that chain rock. But now that other one, look, over on the other side. You had to carefully slip her over and walk sharp to the harbour side just past it. Wasn't easy in a contrary wind, you know. Nothing to it now, of course, with your fancy engines. I'm sorry, and we didn't lay off there for five days waiting for fair winds either. It was the fishing captains inside that wouldn't let us through at first. Thirty-six of them that were in there. <laughs> Thought we were pirates. Where are you getting all this information from? From this? Well, mostly. It says in there that you waited for five days. <laughs> five?
five days. Throw the damnable thing away. Historians never get anything right. How long are you going to be doing this thing? About ten days, I think. Ten days? <laughs> That's not too bad. I should get permission to stay in the, in the interests of historical accuracy, so to speak. Ah, excellent, excellent. You wouldn't mind my being here? No, it would be wonderful. Give us an opportunity to get the information from the horse's mouth, in a manner of speaking. What a change. For a change, perhaps, but in the meantime, what were you doing in Newfoundland in 1583 anyway? What was I doing here in 1583? I'd have been here 20 years earlier if I could have persuaded that woman that we were losing the Americas by default to the Spaniards and the Portugals. That woman? Oh. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. Oh, I've known her since we were youngsters of 15 or 16. I, I tried to tell her that we had to have people living in the place in order to have a lasting claim on it. But that was my plan. Forced settlement, organized planting. Clean out the jails in England, I said. Clean out the whorehouses, clean out the almshouses and bring them over here and put them to work. Well, that was the only way to do it. You see, if we could settle the hungry and needy in a Christian place under hold God's it, heaven... Hold it, hold it, right there. If we're going to do this, we really have to get it started properly. You have quite a story to tell, Sir Humphrey. In God's truth, I have. Now, it says here that you were born in England in, uh, in 1537. I was born in the very best part of England, in Devon, in the village of Greenway, on the most beautiful river Dart. An enchanting spot, Mr. Brown. A most enchanting spot. He was born here at the Greenway Estate, on the River Dart in Devon, the second son of Otho and Catherine Gilbert. Now occupying the site at Greenway is the former residence of the famous Agatha Christie, and now lived in by the illustrious writer's daughter. His father was a man of wealth and importance in West Country England, and in addition to owning Greenway and other properties, he'd inherited this magnificent fortified house known as Compton Castle. Dating from the 1300s, it has remained with a single break in the Gilbert family for 600 years. This is Compton Castle today, almost completely restored through the work of Commander Walter Raleigh Gilbert, the 17th generation of his family to live here. Compton had been sold in 1800, but Commander Gilbert bought it back in 1930 and spent the next 26 years repairing the house and rebuilding the Great Hall. In 1950, he donated the entire property to the British National Trust, and each year, thousands of tourists come to visit Compton. Commander Gilbert's widow, Mrs. Joan Gilbert, spends part of the year at Compton, and is quite familiar with the story of the old building. It's a manor house, really. It's become called Compton Castle because it has a certain prestige, and it was probably thus named in the Victorian period, and it's a nice alliteration. It's good for tourism, and also rather good for the National Trust, it sounds handsome. The house in plan is like the letter H, the east and the west wings, and the great hall connecting them. It was fortified against the French between 1400 and 1500, when the curtain wall that you see as you walk up the drive was added to the base of the two side wings. Notably, and rather rare in this part of the world, the matriculations, they are slots. The guard could hide behind the crenellations, the upright parts, and, and pour down boiling oil or molten lead or even very hot water down the matriculations on anybody who's rash enough to try and scale are very thick walls. It's all stone, solid limestone, with the exception of the borders, you might say, of the um, matriculations and the corbels that support them are of Dartmoor granite, the same kind of granite of which London Bridge is built.
Because the family fortunes had declined considerably as a result of the expedition to Newfoundland, the um, family moved to Bodmin, and the succeeding uh, people were not particularly interested in the past history, and Compton became an ivy-clad ruin, and um, they really had much time for it. My husband decided he really must come and see it, and he vowed that one day, with God's help, he would recover the property, if possible, restore it enough to live in it. He had no money, but it did, as you see, all come to pass. My husband was rarely dedicated to it. They were here for three years on end, working. There's no doubt about it, it's an accurate restoration. But when we had the great joy of getting back into the house, one of the first things we did was to restore the chapel to use, and um, we had to have it reconsecrated by the Bishop of Exeter. We lived here for 16 years after having recovered it, but we had really made ourselves so taxable by the restoration, we really had to give it to the National Trust, who had been angling for us for all those 16 years. They were very, very keen to have Compton, partly because of the historic interest, naturally, of Sir Humphrey and Sir Walter, and also because the architecture, particularly of the front wall, is so absolutely pure and unspoiled. Sir Humphrey was very much overshadowed by his half-brother, Sir Walter Raleigh, who was a very popular figure. And Sir Humphrey, of course, his life was much shorter than Raleigh's. Mercifully, he never reached the Tower of London like the poor Sir Walter did. And my husband was very, very anxious to, to bring him forward. He felt that he was of very great importance, being, as Sir Winston Churchill had said, the first great pioneer of the West. And, of course, the founder of our of the, well, perhaps now slightly in decline, British Empire, but nevertheless, the first and oldest dominion. He was of great interest. Humphrey Gilbert was nine when his father died here at Compton. His mother later married a widower named Raleigh, who had three sons of his own. A popular Victorian painting by Sir John Millet depicts Gilbert and his new half-brother, who was to become the famous Sir Walter Raleigh. An old sailor on a Devon seashore points to the new world across the sea, spinning tales that supposedly inspired the lads to become their generation's leading exponents of colonization in North America. Gilbert was sent to Eton and Oxford to study navigation and military science. In 1554, a young Princess Elizabeth was sent to the Tower by Bloody Mary for Protestant plotting. An aunt of Humphrey Gilbert named Kate Ashley, a governess, volunteered to go to jail with the royal prisoner. When Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558, Kate Ashley was a palace favorite, and a bevy of her relatives descended upon London to take advantage of her connections. Among them was nephew Humphrey. His aunt introduced him at court, recommended him for a career in the royal service, and the young queen took an instant liking to the handsome young man from Devon. At 25, Humphrey Gilbert was serving in France with the English forces at Le Havre. He later volunteered to go to Ireland as the captain of a company of 100 men he'd recruited himself in Devon. They were to help put down a new rebellion in Ulster against Elizabeth. It was in Ireland that he heard others talk of the great riches in the new world beyond the sea, and he was first seized with a passion to explore this land across the Atlantic. No, 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 lad. You've got it all wrong again. I mean, I mean, it, it, it sounds fine. The seized with a passion. 